there, welcome to Summit Online. This is where you'll find the weekend worship experience coming right to where you are. In fact, we have two ways to watch. First, you can access the full worship service on demand on our YouTube channel. So don't forget to subscribe. This is a great option for families watching together. Or maybe you missed the weekend service and wanna catch up later in the week. Second, we host a live service on Sundays at 9 or 11 a.m. at live.summitchurch.com. We never want you to worship alone, so this is an awesome opportunity to connect with a digital community through the live chat option. Plus, we have hosts, actual humans, ready to connect with you, answer any questions, or pray with you in our digital chat rooms. If this is your first time joining us, I am so glad that you are here. In fact, I believe God has a purpose in you being here today. Here at The Summit, we exist to create a movement of disciple-making disciples here in the Raleigh-Durham area and around the world. We pray this worship service allows you to grow deeper as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about, the good news of Jesus. So our service will begin shortly, but before it does, I want to let you know about all the ways that you can engage with us today. First, our desire is that families would watch this service together. So we offer resources for all ages, including today's sermon transcript, as well as kids and student notes for your families to follow along. Second, you can give financially. All that you give goes towards all that we do to propel the mission of God forward. And finally, we don't want you to worship alone. So can you think of someone that might wanna join you today? Go ahead and text a friend and ask them to tune in with you. For resources, ways to give, opportunities to connect, and a free download for our first time guests, you can text Next Steps to 33933 or visit summitchurch.com slash next steps. We look forward to worshiping with you today. Welcome to Summit Church Online. Our hope each week is to help you engage with God and to connect with the local church. We are so glad that you are joining us today and we pray that through today's worship and teaching of the word that you will experience God himself. Listen, if this is your first time here, please do us a favor and text the word welcome to 33933. That's welcome 33933, that's right. Go ahead right now, pull out your phone and type in 33933 and then write the word welcome in the message line and one of our staff members, um, an actual person, will follow up with you. And we are a family here at the Summit Church and we want you to be a part of that. And so we wanna make that connection with you right now. In fact, right now, why don't you invite somebody else to join you? Even if this is your first time, you're gonna get your phone out, text somebody else and say, hey, let's jump in together. This is what I'm doing. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds to, to do that right now, okay? Take your phone and text somebody. Seriously, I'm just going to wait. It's going to be awkward. So you do you and I'm just going to stand here. 
Summit family, we have seen God moving, amen? He truly has been so faithful to us. We've seen hundreds of people both online and across our campuses say yes to Jesus Christ and respond in baptism as a profession of their faith over the last couple of weeks. And I think you'll agree with me that the only appropriate way to respond to something like that is by, by not just saying thank you, but by worshiping our faithful God for his grace. So would you join me in praying right now before we sing together? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not only saved us, you've saved us and blessed us to be a blessing. And we thank you that we get to see that. We are convinced, Psalm 27, 13 says, that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And thank you for giving us a taste of that. Thank you that, that we see you work and use even broken people like us to see blessing come to our neighbors and to the nations. We give you thanks for that. We worship you in Jesus' name, amen. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou change. God of covenant and faithful promises. And time and time again, you have proven you'll do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come. your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to Same. Yeah. 
Summit, it is my privilege to be able to um, inter- reintroduce you to um, Pastor Brian Loritz. In the year or so that Pastor Brian has been here, um, uh, we've obviously come to love him and know him, appreciate the ministry gifts that he has, but I- I've also learned a few things about him. Uh, did you know when he got here, he moved from California, he did not eat beef. You know how difficult that made fellowship. It was sort of like, you know, I'd whatever, and he's got his salad. And so I, I am pleased to report that after just only a year out of California in North Carolina. He is eating, not a lot of red meat, but he's still eating it again. And so we're having a much better time. Uh, Brian's written a number of books. One recently that I, I want to point you to, if you haven't checked it out yet, it's called The Dad Difference. Um, I would encourage you to story of him and his father and, and just how um, God uses people in their families. But um, Brian is a very gifted teacher. In fact, sometimes I'm afraid a little too gifted because um, uh, my speaking requests have gone down while Brian's have gone up. I feel like for a lot of people outside the church, I'm now the other pastor at uh, at the Summit Church in in, uh, in Raleigh, Durham. Um, but anyway, we're very grateful for him. So would you take out your Bible? Um, would you open it and open your heart and open your mind to hear what God has to say to us today? I know it's going to be an, an anointed word from him. Hey, Summit family. It's good being with you all and to share the word of God with you. If you have your Bibles, I want you to meet me in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. It is just a simple word that I want to share with you. Nothing groundbreaking or new. Uh, In fact, it was C.S. Lewis who said, uh, most Christians don't need new revelation. We need to be reminded of old. And I want to really just offer a reminder to us uh, as we gather together and hear the word of God found in Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is Jesus talking. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and, are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But, but, verse 4, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, 
Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, Jesus says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Amen. Many years ago, um, my dad had a close friend of his. In fact, they're still close friends. But many years ago, my dad's close friend was um, gearing up to take a trip overseas uh, to China. He was really excited. The day of the trip came, uh, and he found himself hurriedly uh, running some last-minute errands. In the middle of running these errands, he checked his watch, realized that he is running dangerously close to missing his flight. And so he goes home, gets his stuff, kisses his wife and kids goodbye, tosses his suitcases and stuff in the trunk of his car, slams the trunk uh, shut, hops in the car, and goes speeding down the 105 freeway. He gets to LAX airport, goes to the necessary checkpoints, and lo and behold, he gets on the plane just in time. He puts his um, carry-on baggage into the overhead bin, sits down, is relieved. The plane starts to taxi down the runway. And it's at this moment when the plane is taxiing down the runway that that he began to have this um, overwhelming, pervasive sense that he had forgotten something really important. It, but he couldn't quite put his finger on it. Anybody ever kind of been in a situation like this where you're just like, man, I've, I've forgotten something, but I can't quite call what it is. And he's trying to scan the recesses of his mind. And then finally, about 35,000 feet in the air, somewhere over the Pacific, it hits him what he forgot. And at the revelation of it, he just kind of buried his face in his hands and was just like, man, I just can't believe I would forget this. See, in his haste to make his plane over to China, he pulled up curbside at LAX airport, jumped out of his car, left the car running, the car door open, and here he is on his way to China, and Lord knows what has happened to his car. See, in his pursuit to take care of a, of a good thing, he neglected to take care of an essential thing. See, while he could have caught many airplanes to China, he only had one car. Again, in his pursuit of taking care of a good thing, he neglected to take care of an essential thing. It's a truism to life. All of us know what it's like at various levels to to exchange the essential for the good. I mean, dads, we understand this, don't we? Uh, I got a 20-year-old, he just left the house, praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, like arrows in the hand, not boomerangs, uh, but my 20-year-old has left the house, my 18-year-old's leaving this summer to go off to college, I got a 16-year-old and two more years, if everything goes according to plan, we are empty nesters, and I feel like I am just now starting to figure out this whole fatherhood thing. And as I'm looking at the rearview mirror of just kind of my journey as a dad, of course I've got some regrets. And some of those regrets are, again, this idea of exchanging the essential for the good. There have been seasons, stretches in my journey as a dad where where in my haste to provide a good thing, I have neglected the essential thing of spending quality time with them. Our marriages understand this. This whole idea that we've been called to the essential thing of oneness and soul level harmony and intimacy with one another. And and yet, as Chuck Swindoll says, the problem with life is that it is oh so daily and we know what it's like to just kind of go through stages where we're like ships passing in the night and we get caught up in our own little worlds. We understand this principle of, of exchanging essential things for good things. College students, you get this. If you're a college student, you understand this principle. Here you are on a college campus or maybe on your way back to a college campus and you're forming friendships and making great relationships, which is a good thing. But remember the essential thing, your mom and daddy got you there not to build friendships or relationships ultimately, but to get an education and to study hard. We understand this principle. This is exactly the problem with the church at Ephesus. We're going to unpack it in just a few moments, but their problem is oftentimes our problem as a church, as the people of God. 
This is a group of people engaged in ministry, doing good things. And yet Jesus levies an indictment against them. He says, I, I'm, I've got an issue with you because in your, in your pursuit, you have exchanged me for ministry. I, I don't want to just be on the list. I want to be number one on the list. And that's why I just want to tag our time together around this text as first things first. To just give you a reminder of where Jesus wants to be on your list of priorities. And if he's not first, I love this text. He's going to give us some real practical ways that we can get him back to the essential rightful place that he deserves. Here is here is John, he's de delivering a piece of mail from Jesus. It's, it's to the church at, at Ephesus. Ephesus was considered the New York City of its day. 40 years before this text is given, the Apostle Paul walks into town. Uh, Ephesus, he deemed to be so essential that of all the cities he walked into to plant churches, he spends the longest time in Ephesus, three years. He plants a church, a growing community comes together. It's actually a multi-ethnic community of Jew and Gentile alike. You can read about it in Acts chapter 19, later on in Acts chapter 20. Uh, this community starts to grow and it becomes this emerging missionary hub. In fact, it's almost impossible to understand the New Testament without understanding the church at Ephesus. In fact, on this list of churches that Jesus decides to write, seven churches, the fact that Ephesus is first is an indicator light of its influence. This was an amazing church. It was a wonderful church. It was a great church. And as Jesus opens up these words, he gives them to the church. Listen to what he says again in verse one. He says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, Stop right there. Many scholars believe that, that the angel, whose essential um, work is that of being a messenger, many scholars believe that this angel would be the leader or the pastor of the church. So here is Jesus talking to the leader of the church. He says, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now stop right here. What exactly are the seven stars or the seven golden lampstands? You don't need a commentary to figure this out. Just look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 with me. Here it says, as for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So here he is talking to the leaders of the church at Ephesus. And the fact that they're in his hand, hear it now, it's a picture of God's sovereign control. When Jesus says to the leaders, you're, you're in my hand, it is a picture of him saying, this is my church. I'm in control of this church. And then Jesus says, I've been walking among you. I've been walking among the churches. This isn't a picture of, of Jesus kind of as a security guard waiting to, to pick out something wrong and, and to critique them. No, it is a sign of his pastoral presence and shepherding care. Here's what I want you to see. Jesus is identifying himself as it relates to the people of God in the local churches as being one who exercises sovereign care. Well, Brian, what does that mean for you and I? Thanks for the background information, but what does this have to do with the price of tea in China? What does this have to do when the alarm clock goes off on Monday morning? What does this have to do with my life? One of the ways it has to do with our life is if Jesus is in control of the people of God and of his church exercising sovereign care, then this eliminates worry. What is worry? Max Lucado is very helpful, the great author and pastor. M Max Lucado tells us that worry is our emotional reaction to a perceived event. This is different, Max Lucado says, from fear. Because while worry is our emotional reaction to a perceived event, fear is our emotional reaction to an actual 
event. Or worry, as Tony Evans says, is paying interest on trouble not yet due. That's why in Matthew 6, Jesus, the same person who's talking to the church of Ephesus, would say three times, therefore, do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. Do not be anxious. Why? Well, interesting, his reason for telling his people not to worry in Matthew 6 is the exact reason he gives to the church at Ephesus because of his sovereign care. Several times in Matthew 6, he tells them, I don't want you to be anxious. Why? Because I take care of the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. How much more so will I take care of you who have been made in the very image of God? What does this mean for us, Summit Churches? What what does this mean for us as a family of God? 2020 has been something else. In fact, uh, 2021, one of my buddies says it feels like December 82nd, 2020. There's a lot going on. And there's a lot that would make us, make us tempted towards worry. Maybe you just look at our political climate. What's going to happen in the decisions that are being made or the bills that are on the table there in Washington, D.C.? It can cause us to worry. I'm on the board of a Christian university. And we, we've been spending a lot of time lately talking about what happens if the Equality Act comes to pass and there's the temptation to worry. We can also think of, hey, we're in the middle of a pandemic and it looks like it's receding, but you talk to the average pastor of so many churches in America and across the world, they've been tempted to worry over this pandemic the last 20 plus years, or excuse me, the last year or so. Or you can just talk about our racial climate, the division that's happening. And I've been working with so many churches on this very issue here. And some people think we're talking about it too much, and some people think we're not talking about enough in the division and the front. What's going to happen to the church of Jesus Christ? Jesus is saying, relax. I'm in control. I want you to just look at the testimony of Scripture and church history. Jesus is saying, Summit, you're not the only church to to be in the political climate you're in. Summit, do you realize that the church of Jesus Christ has endured global pandemics like the Black Plague? Do you realize it's endured all kinds of things and yet she is not just surviving, she is thriving, not because of its human leaders, but because of its divine leader. Jesus is saying, I'm in control. And because of that, you can rest easy. Now he moves further in and he talks specifically to the church at Ephesus. He begins by giving them a commendation. This commendation has kind of nine items in which he applauds them for. Now I'm not going to give you a line by line audit, but you just need to understand that the nine things that Jesus commends the church at Ephesus for can fit into three buckets. First thing he says to them is, hey, I just want to commend you, church at Ephesus. You are a hard-working church. This is what he means when he gets at verse 2. He says, I know your works, your toil. Pastor J.D. has taught us this over the years. The New Testament is written in a language called Greek. The Greek word for toil means to labor to the point of exhaustion. He says, church at Ephesus, you're not a lazy church. I mean, you're You're a hardworking church. No doubt you've got your job out in the marketplace, but I I just want to stand back and applaud you. I mean, you're not just working your nine to five in the marketplace. You're you're showing up in ministry and you're out there in the parking lot ministry or serving with children's, whatever it may be. You are a hardworking church. But secondly, he commends them for not just being a hardworking church. He commends them for being a faithful church. He tells them in verse 2, I know your works, your toil, and your, here it is, patient endurance. The idea behind the word endurance here, it speaks of a power to endure hardship or stress. That's been us, isn't it? I mean, we've endured a lot. and We didn't fizzle out. You've endured. You've showed up. You're faithful. Thirdly, and finally, he commends them for being a hardworking church and a faithful church. And then finally, he commends them for being a discerning church. 
He says, and how you can bear, verse 2, with how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Look at verse 6. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans. This was a heretical group, which I also hate. He says, look, church at Ephesus, I want to I applaud you. Just because someone stands up at your church and opens up the scroll and preaches the word, you're, you don't automatically co-sign. You're discerning. It's a real mark of their maturity in Christ. I mean, can't you hear Jesus clapping? <laughs> Hardworking, faithful, man, discerning. Then verse four, but. Ain't it just like Jesus to find something wrong? I mean, it's sort of like, you know, taking your car to Jiffy Lube for, you know, just to run the mill oil change and they get done and they go, man, oil looks good, man, everything looks good, but you need a new radiator. Or you sit down at the dentist for what you think is just a, gonna be a regular, you know, I'm getting my teeth cleaned and hey, teeth look good, but you have a cavity or you need a root canal. Here is Jesus, he, he moves right from the commendation to the critique and boy, is it one doozy of a critique. He says, verse four, to this hardworking, faithful, discerning church, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. The Greek word for abandon literally means to send away. This word is oftentimes used uh, uh, and is translated as the word forgiveness. Now, forgiveness ultimately is what we do to offenses. We send them away. Now, while this word is great with offenses, it's horrible with Jesus. He's not talking to people who are living in the flesh. He's not talking to people who are sitting at home on Sunday morning or Thursday evenings. He's not talking to individuals who are doing life on their own terms. He's talking to people who've been saved for years. And he says, I got an issue with you. At some point, ministry became more important than me. At some point, your identity was placed in your quiet time or your generosity or, or the fact that you've gone on mission trips. Those things became more important than me. You've left your first love. Now, Summit, I went to uh, <laughs> I went to Bible college so I'd get out of math. Um, you know, when my kids, you know, when they hit fractions, that's when I tapped out. I'm like, there's an app for that. God bless you. Um, but I do remember this for math. Uh, math, I remember a section of math called the order of operations. Order of operations is kind of those equations uh, that are in parentheses, right? Where you got addition, subtraction, uh, you've got multiplication, you got division. And essentially what order of operations says is you don't just jump in there any old kind of way and start doing the math. No, there's a sequence that you have to do. Fundamentally, what order of operation says, hear it, is you can get the math right, but if you get the sequence wrong, the whole thing is wrong. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. You got your math right, but your sequence is wrong. And when your sequence is wrong, the whole thing is just null and void. I've got an issue with you. You've left your first love. Now that raises a question. What is first love? He doesn't just say you've left your love. You've left your first love. What's the difference between first love, second love, 10th love, 100th love? What's the difference? What sets first love apart? What sets it apart is the word passion. First love is passion. I remember when I, um, when I first laid eyes on the woman that's now my wife, Corey. Corey Benavides. My wife is half Mexican, half Irish, all fine. <laughs> she had gotten saved at a church I was working at, and I felt compelled to be a part of her spiritual formation process. 
And we started hanging out, and uh, this girl, she won my heart. She turned this introvert into an extrovert. We, we started getting on the phone and just talking until the wee hours in the morning on the phone. Uh, back then, um, it's kind of the CD world, you know, this little disc that you kind of insert into a deal there. And, uh, and we both liked this group called KC and JoJo. And, and so she'd be at her apartment in North Hollywood and I'd be at my apartment in Paramount. And uh, we'd put the CD in at the same time, go to the same track and press play at the same time. Man, first love makes you do cheesy stuff. There's passion. And then 18 months later, we get married. And not long into the marriage, my wife comes to me and she says, we're off. We're not connecting. Something, something is wrong. And, and no lie, this is what I said to her. Don't judge me. I'm going to feel judgment, but don't judge me. She comes to me and she says, we're, we're off. Something's wrong. I don't feel like you love me. And I responded to her, honey, if you ever doubt my love, just, just look at the roof. We got a place to live. Look, look at the refrigerator. Open up the pantry. It didn't go so well, and I do feel some judgment. The reason why that didn't go well is because my wife understood that doing stuff for her should never take the place of being with her. That those things have to flow out of a first love passion. That is exactly the simplistic message of our text. Anytime Jesus is not first love, it is akin to us saying to him, hey Jesus, just look at my tithing record. Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Those things flow out of a passionate relationship with me. See, what this text teaches us is, is I can get tithing wrong, but if I get Jesus, I can get tithing right, but if I get Jesus wrong, the whole thing is messed up. Those things must flow out of an intimate, abiding relationship with me. Listen, there's no judgment here. We've all been there. All of us, not all of you, all of us. So when we go there, how do we get back to first love? Our text tells us. Verse five, Jesus says, when you get your priorities out of whack and you wanna get them back in order where I'm your first love, he says, verse five, here it is, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Here, here it is, Brian, when you're in that stage of life where preaching means more than being with Jesus. Brian, when you're at this stage of life, when you're in that season where family has taken the place of Jesus, do these three things. Remember, repent, redo. Remember, repent, redo. Wherever you may be, would you just say those words with me? Remember, repent, redo. One more time. Remember, repent, redo. He says, remember. The scholar Charles, Charles Barclay says, the road back to first love begins with memory. He, he, he says, when you've, when you found yourself off track, remember when you were on track. Go back to that. That's why when you read the Old Testament, friends, whenever God moves, one of the things that constantly we catch God saying is build an altar. Like, like, like don't just go on business. You. I want you to actually build an altar. Altars are spiritual mile markers. So that in the future, when you're with your kids and you're traipsing through this section of town and they see this altar of stones and your kid goes, now what is that? You stop and remember the faithfulness of God. Remember. I hope I don't uh, lose my man card on this. When my wife goes out of town, I'm a wreck. I'm just, I, I don't do well when she's out of town and I'm at home. Again, I'm going to turn in my man card on this one, but oftentimes, and I hope we just keep this between us, when my wife goes out of town, oftentimes I'll sleep on her side of the bed. I'm feeling some judgment. 
And I'll sleep on her side of the bed just because I want to catch a whiff of her scent. There's been times I've walked on her side of the closet. True story. I'm feeling judgment. And I'll smell her clothes. There's a connection between our sense of smell and memory. By the way, when I've used this illustration before, I've had men come to me like Nicodemus came to Jesus in secret and go, I I do that too. (laughs) And smelling her causes me to remember and it stokes a passion. When you find yourself on track, Jesus is saying, remember. Remember the times when all you had was me. Maybe remember when you first got saved and, and, and you didn't know any Bible verse, you had to memorize anything, but, but you're just telling everyone about him because all you know is I've met this individual and he's moved into my life. And he, he says, remember that. But when, when you find yourself so sophisticated in your faith that the passion is gone, Remember when you didn't know how to pray and you didn't dot all your theological I's and cross all your theological T's, but you were just so grateful and there was a rawness and an earthiness because he was a living reality. Remember that. Secondly, he says, repent. Now, this is interesting. Last time I checked, repent, this idea of repenting in the Bible means I'm going in one direction, I need to change course and go in the other direction. Last time I checked, the only thing we repent of in the Bible is sin. In essence, Jesus is saying, if I'm not first, Brian, it's sin. (laughs) I ain't just trying to be on the list. If I'm not first, That tells me, Brian, is you've erected an idol. And an idol is anything, even a good thing, that's become an ultimate thing. Brian, do you love preaching more than me? Brian, do you love your kids more than me? Are you more passionate, Brian, about your youngest son in basketball more than me? Repent. And then thirdly and finally, he says, Redo, redo, go back and do the things that you did when I was your first love. Sort of like what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis, he's talking more in the context of a, of a human relationship that's lost its love. He, he, he gives this insight. C.S. Lewis says, something becomes precious when we treat it as precious. In other words, what C.S. Lewis is saying is, he's saying if, if you felt like in your marriage that, that, that the passion is gone, don't wait until you feel it. Do the acts of passion and then the feelings will follow. Brian, what that means is, you know, if you and Corey are off, you know, you might want to take a stop at Whole Paycheck, I mean Whole Foods, buy some flowers. Even when you don't feel like it, do the works. And the feelings will come. So maybe what some of that means for us right now is, and when he was first, I me, mean, I was fasting. When, 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 when he was first love, maybe I was just sharing my faith. When, when he was first love, I was lingering in his scriptures, redo. What happens when we do those things? Jesus ends with this promise. He ends by saying, verse 7, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. What is paradise? Whenever you see paradise in the Bible, it has to do with the presence of God. Creation, the Garden of Eden was, was paradise where they experience the presence of God. On the cross, Jesus says to to the thief, he says, today, not just that you'll be in paradise, you'll be with me. Paradise in the Bible is the presence of God. Here's what he's saying. When you remember repent and redo, 
and you get your priorities together, you experience the presence of God. It's not that you lost it. If you're a believer, you cannot lose the presence of God. But when Jesus is first love, when I'm going to war with sin and, and, and the sequence is right, I experience the sweetness of his presence. And then he says in verse 7, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. The idea of the word life there, it's, it's exuberance, it's abundance, it's fullness. It can also mean hap- happiness or joy. Psalm Psalm 16 puts it together when it says this, in his presence there is fullness of joy. So what happens when he's first? And I'm experiencing his presence and there's that fullness. (laughs) I want that, that fullness of joy. Summit family, I believe this is a word for us as we are reconnecting with the mission of God and I just love our heart here for multiplication and discipleship, and there's all kinds of ways we can engage. And I was talking to some people um, at our church who are about to get on a plane and go overseas to engage in a mission trip. I love the way that we end each week. You are sent, man. Yes, 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 and amen. But never forget on the other side of that is a person. We do those things in the name of Jesus. I want you to imagine with me a young man and he's just hit send on his dissertation for his PhD and he sent it in and he's all excited, man. And, and the advisor gets back to him and he says, look, man, good news and bad news. Good news is I've read your dissertation and it looks great. You're ready to defend. We're, we're excited to be able to confer this degree on you, man, but I got some bad news for you. The bad news is that the registrar told me it's an oversight you got to take German. I know we should have caught that earlier, but you, you got to take German and, you know, just, just sit with a tutor, learn German, take this test, and you're good. I bet you there's not much joy there as he sits with a tutor three hours a day, five days a week, just having to do something to check it off the list. But now imagine another man. He's out one evening and he sees a woman and, man, is heart is smitten. It's one of those rare moments where you just kind of know, man, that's the person I'm supposed to spend my life with. And he goes over to her and he feels some sort of a connection, some sort of a way, but realizes she doesn't speak a lick of English, only German. And of course he's saying, well, I got to learn the language. So he gets a tutor, sits with a tutor three hours a day, five days a week. Do you think this person's got some joy? Do you think this person is motivated? Why? What's the difference? One individual is just checking it off a list. It's out of duty. It's out of responsibility. For the other person, there's a person on the other side of that. Listen, I grew up in the South. I I know about cultural Christianity. My folks were believers, are believers, love the Lord. It takes one to know one. I know what it's like to go through the motions with the best of them. Oh, Summit, may it never be said of us. You've left your first love. First things first. Yeah, we're sent. Yeah, we give. Yeah, we're generous. But we do that out of an intimate, abiding, passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. No matter where you may be, I, I, I want us to sit just a few moments with this word. I believe the Spirit of God's been speaking. He's been wearing me out in my study. So would you just take some moments right now in silence and let the Spirit of God mess with you. Is Jesus first? Is he your first love? Not is he on the list. Is he first? Let's spend a few moments reflecting and I'll close us in prayer.
Father, we've all been there. We've all been there. Lord, would you be the passion of our souls? Would you forgive us, Lord God, where we've gotten the sequence, the sequence wrong? May we remember, repent, and re redo. And as a result, Lord God, may we feel that fullness of joy, your manifest presence. I pray this over us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. You said on the road into Jerusalem to be delivered to the hands of men, you would be crucified. On the third day, you would rise. You said that your sacrifice would cover sin. Every outcast would be welcomed in. You seek and save the lost. Now we know the Father's heart. How great your compassion, how perfect your love, my Jesus, you've You said that the old is gone, the new has come, and the victory has just begun. The truth will set me free, but I am free, yes, free indeed. Yeah. How great your compassion. the redeemed say so.
Wow, I love that song. Did you know that that song is a Summit Worship original? We have some incredibly talented, gifted people on our team. And what an awesome um, expression to be able to worship Christ, our Redeemer, um, both personally and together as a people. Not to mention the um, just that um, insightful and inspiring word that Pastor Brian just brought toward us. Um, I'm praying that your love for Christ, your love for the gospel will be renewed. Um, what an incredible, incredible word. Um, next week, Lord, Lord willing, I look forward to jumping back into the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter two. So if you want to read and get ahead a little bit, um, we'll, we'll, we'll join together there in the book of Daniel. Um, Summit Church, you are anointed, you are called, you are filled with the Holy Spirit to go and be a witness, to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, to the uttermost parts of the earth. So Summit Church, in the knowledge of that and with the confidence of the gospel, you are sent. <laughs>